We'll talk, we've talked in the past about regression with continuous or quantitative predictors. Now we've introduced categorical predictors. Let's put them together. Little example here, we're going to use a categorical predictor gender and a continuous predictor high school GPA to predict an outcome variable SAT score. So here's our, our, our setup for the model, outcome variable, one predictor in two categories, and a continuous predictor. Uh, always a good idea. Let's look at our data, see what we're talking about here. Um, let's see, we've got um, uh, SAT, let's see, where is it? Yeah, SAT and gender is our first predictor. It's a little hard to see if there's a relationship here, but there's a small correlation and it's significant. With all the cloud of the data points stacking up, it's, it's hard to see it. Box plots are better than scatter plots. Uh, for SAT and high school GPA, either here or here, you can see that there's a positive relationship, statistically significant. Uh, the relationship between uh, gender and high school GPA, basically no relationship, no correlation there. Let's build the model. There we go, intercept plus slope times predictor plus slope times predictor. This is what we would like to do. What do we got here? Well, if we're using our strategy of dummy coding uh, gender, um, what will happen here? Uh, our intercept is the expected value when all the predictors are zero. So when gender is zero and high school GPA is zero, well, we're talking about gender is zero, that's females who have a zero high school GPA. What would we predict for their SAT? That's not very in informative to us because you don't have a zero as a high school GPA. All right, what about the slopes? Gender. This is the expected difference in the outcome for the one unit difference in x1 holding all else constant. So this is the expected difference in SAT between two groups, the gender equals zero, females, and gender equals one group, males, for subjects that are otherwise the same. That is, they have the same high school GPA that is controlling for that. What do we think the difference between female and male is on SAT? The second slope, B2, is, well, what's the expected difference in the outcome SAT for a one unit difference in high school GPA holding all else constant? That is. Notice the expected difference in the outcome SAT for a one point difference in high school GPA for both males and females. That is, people who are otherwise the same, what if their high school GPA differs by a point? What would we expect their SAT to differ by? That's what the second slope captures. Let's parse through these results. Um, I've got my overall model, I've got an R squared, sums of squares regression. Yep, F statistic, statistically significant. Yes, it is. Um, well, let's, wow, look here. Um, if I have an intercept coefficient for gender and high school GPA, I might ask, why, why is this different? That is, why is, why is gender, the coefficient for gender here different than it would have been without both predictors in the model? Well, it's because I've got now multiple predictors. The coefficient for gender is not the difference in group means. It's the model difference in groups holding constant the other predictors. We're going to look at this issue visually later on today. Let's go through results. Um, so our coefficients, the first slope for gender, 55.70, that's the average difference between males and females holding constant high school GPA. So for males and females who are the same on high school GPA, what is their difference? Just due to being male or female, according to our model. Uh, what's the slope for high school GPA? 130.94, that says for a one point or one unit difference in high school GPA, on average, 
we'd expect a 130.944 point difference in SAT holding constant gender. That is, this applies to both males and females. Here are the results graphically, a little scatter plot of the continuous predictor, high school GPA, and the outcome variable SAT. And they are color coded by group membership. So the, uh, the blue dots, those are uh, gender coded as zero, those are females. The green dots, uh, that's the group coded as one, those are the males. In essence, what we're getting is a kind of regression of, in this case, SAT on high school GPA for each group. You can think about this model as generating a regression line or a regression model for each group. This is our overall fitted regression. So let's go group by group. For females, they got a value of zero on gender, so this is going to drop out, and we're left with intercept plus 130.94 multiplied by high school GPA. For males, they're going to have a one on gender, so this term becomes activated. We get a prediction line of, well, let's see, 609.2 plus 55.7 is 664.9 plus, again, 130.94 times high school GPA. So now it's effectively saying, give me a regression for each of the groups where they differ in their intercept. The slope of SAT on high school GPA is modeled as being the same in both groups, but the intercepts are allowed to differ. And here's a picture of that. I've drawn those lines in. The line in blue is for the group coded as zero, females. The line in green is for the group coded one, males. So we built a model that has two predictors, one of them a continuous variable, and one of them a categorical or grouping variable with two categories right now. In effect, what comes out of this model when we realize that the grouping variable can only take on a value of 0 and 1 is two group-specific regression lines that have the same slope but are allowed to differ in their intercept. If I wanted to have the slopes be allowed to vary, that is, okay, let's let the uh, males and females not only have different intercepts, but different slopes, how do you think we could do that? What do we think? Hmm? Change in high school GPA? It's not a change. If I want to say the slope of or the coefficient for high school GPA here is the same for females and males. If I want to say that the slope for one predictor differs based on another predictor, an it's an interaction. Yeah. So let's do an interaction between a categorical and quantitative predictor. We've built a regression model that has a categorical and quantitative predictor, and what we've seen is that it implies that the groups can have different intercepts, but not different slopes. To get different slopes, we have to include an interaction term. All right, so here we go. Generically, I'm going to have three predictors. The first one is my dummy code for the grouping variable gender. The second one is high school GPA, and the third one should be the product term, the interaction between them. Now we talked about centering variables when we form products for interactions. Uh, in general, I do not center my categorical variables. I'm going to leave that as a zero one. I could 
center high school GPA and then enter it into my model as a predictor and put it in as part of the uh, product term. But in this case, the correlation between the predictors is pretty small. It's basically negligible. Mm -hmm. Remember, centering helps reduce collinearity. Well, in this case, I don't really have a problem with collinearity because the predictors aren't that correlated. I could center, but in this case, not centering doesn't cost me all that much. So it's not going to be that bad. If we think about this model, this huge thing, as being a regression of SAT on high school GPA, what we can see is that the first slope, B1, effectively says, how does the intercept change from male, males and females? And the interaction coefficient says, how does the slope for high school GPA change for males and females? Let's get some results. Uh, here is a, uh, when I ran this model one way, I ran it in a hierarchical framework that is running two regression models. In the first one, I put in high school GPA and gender. And here is my uh, expression here. This is SPSS output. I get R squared. Um, uh, yeah, and down here, that's model one. I get those coefficients. This is the model we just looked at with two predictors. The second model, row two in this table, says also include the product, gender times high school GPA. That's the interaction term. So when I put in the interaction term, the R squared goes from 0.176 to 0.180. Not a huge increase. I get a test of whether that difference is statistically significant, and it is. And down here, um, yeah, down here I get the coefficients under the model that includes the interaction. Yeah, good. So here's my uh, summary of regression results here. This full model, R squared is 0.18. Um, overall, three degrees of freedom in the model that includes the interaction. It's statistically significant. Here are my coefficients for gender, high school GPA, and the interaction term. T statistics, confidence intervals, um, squared partial correlation is their unique contribution to R squared. As we said, if you include the interaction, how much more do you get? Basically not much, really small. Let's look at the, what it implies for the groups. Okay, here's our equation with the coefficients. Let's plug in. For females, they have a value of zero on the gender variable, so that's gonna drop out. This is gonna drop out. We're left with this equation, intercept plus slope times high school GPA. For males, they're going to have a 1 on the gender variable, so this is going to be included and combined with 547.11 to get a, a male-specific intercept. And now this is active here in the interaction. We get this 149.8 minus 46.82 takes me down to a 102.97 for the sum. If I look at this as two groups, I have a regression specific to each group that is allowed to differ in their intercept, and they're now allowed to have different slopes. Thank you, interaction term. Here are those lines plotted right here. The line for um, males in green, the line for females in blue. These lines are allowed to differ in their intercept. And you can see a slight difference in their slope. Is that difference in slope captured by the interaction term? Is it statistically significant? Not really. But I'm depicting it here. Questions or thoughts so far? We're going to go through this again with like visually visualizing different patterns and trying to understand all the capabilities here. But we've just done one example so far.
Uh, here's how I would write this up. Usual stuff, I got a sample of this many uh, participants. I have a model regressing the outcome. Here's some summary statistics on predictors, gender. I'll give you the proportion in each group uh, and the other predictor. And interaction was examined, but not found to be statistically significant. The unique contribution R squared was really small, not significant. Gender was statistically significant as a predictor. Here's a summary, as was high school GPA. The results support interpretation that on average holding all is constant. Males tended to perform better on the SAT and that higher high school GPA corresponds to higher SAT scores. However, there is not evidence to support a conclusion that the relationship between high school GPA and SAT differs for males and females. The interaction was not really that meaningful, wasn't statistically significantly different from zero, didn't explain much in terms of the outcome variable, so I'd say the slopes really aren't that different for the two groups. If um, every time we have two or more than two uh, predictors, do we every time test the interaction? If you want the slopes to vary, so um, what we're seeing here in this model is we have two group, we have one variable that's about grouping, mm -hmm. and we have one other predictor that's a continuous variable. Effectively, we can think about this as a regression of the outcome on the continuous variable where there's a separate regression line for each group. Mm -hmm. If you have many more predictors, this gets more complicated, and then you'd have a separate multiple regression for each group, males and females. So the same, it generalizes, but we can't make a nice pretty picture with just one more predictor. We have, we have to have more complicated pictures. Yeah. Mm, what I want to ask is um, if, if there is like two or two predictors, um, first we need to do is to test whether or not they have interaction, or we do not need to do that at all? You don't need to. It's, it's up to you if, if you're interested in that hypothesis. Looking at this regression model, I can look at it, let me go back here. I can look at it as a multiple regression model. Um, with a couple of predictors, gender, high school GPA, and in this case, the interaction between those. What the interaction conceptually allows is a difference in the groups in their slopes. If that's of interest to you, you gotta look at it through the interaction, yeah. Or, let me say that again. If that's of interest to you, you need a model that allows you to say, hey, do these two groups differ in their slope? The interaction is one way to do that. There are other techniques we're going to turn to later in our course uh, that, that involve things like allowing groups to differ in their slopes and things. But through what we've talked about so far in regression, that's what the interaction does. If your story, just to go back a few uh, pictures, if your story is, well, I got two groups and they're allowed to differ in their intercepts, like on average, but I think the relationship between the outcome and the other predictors is the same. That is, the slope is the same. I don't need an, I don't need an interaction for that. And in fact, let's, let's turn to that and think about what are the different ways of conceptualizing what we've done here. You can look at what we're doing from a few different perspectives, and that reveals some things to us. <clears throat> 